In 2021, there was an uptick in, in expenditure for women's health initiative related research, specifically on women. So there is an effort to put more money and more resources towards women's research. And we have had some very strong studies come out in the last you know, two years that really call into question the sort of dogma that we've had over the last two decades. We have so much data but that data isn't being assimilated and pulled into a way to be able to help give directive because there's just not money in it. We're gonna have this continued bias and this continued sort of lack of change in the medical community. And I really think that women in this age group, we have the opportunity to change the entire industry, the entire world, honestly. I would really love to start our conversation around the menopause controversy. I feel like in many ways, if we speak about menopause as a medical condition versus a natural process, and how do we make sense and tease this out so that women can get the kind of care that they deserve to have without feeling like they've done something wrong? Right, right. So I think you're absolutely right. We have this extraordinary controversy where on one side of the camp, it is the menopause transition is just a passage of life and we just need to buck it up and deal with it. And, and it's just what happens. And then on the other side of it is, is it a disease state? So I'm personally in the disease state camp and I'm gonna explain why. So first off, we have to think about how women's research has been mis misused and actually not done, not even until the nineties. So we didn't include women in medical research until the mid nineties, because they didn't want our pesky hormones to mess up their data, right? And so most of the drugs that we take for granted and we give to women indiscriminately in, the, in conventional medicine have never been tested on women. And in many cases are counterproductive. And so when we look at menopause out of that lens, so menopause is a natural state. It is a natural state of aging. However, we have to remember surviving significantly after menopause is not a natural state, period. End of sentence. We are one of two mammals that live significantly after reproductive time. And so in 1900, our lab average lifespan was 57 years. So if you took a nosedive hormonally in your early 50s, who cares, right? Who cares if that accelerated aging in your heart disease and your osteoporosis and dementia because you died early anyway? But modern science and, you know, sanitation and medical science allows us to stay alive a lot longer. And menopause is the only state in the body that we say, oh, no, that's natural. Don't replace the hormone. Although if your thyroid hormone fails to be made, we replace it. Insulin fails to be made appropriately, we replace it. Growth hormone in a young child who isn't growing appropriately because it's not being made, we replace it without question. But instead, in our clinical assessment and conventional care, we tell women, oh, no, those symptoms are just something you need to have some cognitive behavior therapy around. And all that is is symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. Don't worry about the fact that it's going to accelerate every disease of aging for you. And oh, by the way, your health span is poorer and you're going to live longer than your male counterparts. Right. So if we say that this is a hormone deficiency state, which it is, and that it would constitute as a disease, it does two things. It allows our medical system and NIH and everybody else to put money into servicing women and helping identify how to treat it best. And it also opens the door to maybe that being covered by insurance and Medicare. Because right now, Medicare sets the standard and it says this is a lifestyle and, and preventative measure to make you feel better. Therefore, it is not something is, that is reimbursable. And I think that's the thing. It's, we're not saying that women are broken, right? You're aging and you're, you're living significantly longer than we were designed to live. And in this process, your disease states are going to increase. Well, I think it's so interesting because I know that I've gotten skewered on social media and on a, and a few podcasts when I've talked about menopause as a disease state, because I just want people to understand that you could be doing everything right. You dial in on sleep, you're eating anti-inflammatory nutrition, you're lifting weights, you're doing, you have, you know, some joyful activity in your life. You, you know, you have a loved one that you're close to. I mean, all the things that we know are so important. And even then you will still have 
inflammatory changes, changes in, in metabolic health. Um, if we live long enough where you're going to have a dry vagina, I know that no one likes to talk about this, but I think the statistic for genitourinary symptoms of menopause, this is one of many things that can happen to us by the age of 60, it's 70% of women. So you just start to understand that it is a systemic change in our, just like, you know, when we go from prior to puberty into puberty, it's like we become, we can become very, very different physiologically. And so I love that you're speaking to helping people understand what kinds of services we can have access to, because unfortunately I still feel like a lot of the menopause space, even perimenopause space, a lot of things that women are offered have to be compounded. You know, yes, there are transdermal estrogen patches. There's oral micronized progesterone, which is not a sustained release formulation. It's immediate release. You can get compounded testosterone, but these things are not free. And, and the hope in the endeavor is that as we kind of amplify women's voices at this stage of life, that more and more of these hormonal or menopausal replacement therapies will be covered by insurance. And that I think is instrumental in helping women advocate for themselves because I still have women tell me things like, as an example, you know, my whole background um, as an NP up until eight years ago was in cardiology. So 16 years in cardiology and a woman wrote in yesterday and said, um, my internist said, because I have heart disease, I am not able to have hormone replacement therapy. And I said, well, can you explain to me what that means? This woman had a pacemaker put in. She has a, a sinus bradycardia, so slowed heart rate. She has a conduction system disease. That is not cardiovascular disease. And so I was helping her understand, like, this is not medical advice, but that is very different than knowing you have known blockages in your coronary arteries. That is very, very different. So helping her understand that we just need to find the right provider for you in your area that can actually sit down and talk to you about your risk assessment, talk to you about the benefits of hormone replacement therapy, if that's appropriate for you, and then allow you and he and she, or you and, and this individual to come to a decision about what is best for you long-term. Oh, no, I, I would agree. You know, it's cause that's an electrical problem, right? That's right. not a conduction arter system, yeah, arterial placking. You know, I agree. It's, um, you know, we have enough research today to show that, you know, like you said, the um, we could be exercising, eating right, taking the right supplements, all of those things. We'll have mitochondrial changes with the capacity to be able to utilize glucose. We have changes to visceral fat deposits. So the fat underneath the muscle in your abdomen, that increases regardless of what you're doing. And it doesn't come off from diet and exercise. Research already shows that. So the personal trainers out there that are telling women they just need to work it harder are completely inaccurate. And then you've got the changes to the brain and the risk for the bones and increased arterial placking because of the loss of estrogen and then UTIs, all of that. This is this compounding effect and women get told that you just need to like work it out and get over it. And, um, you know, and I think as a medical community, we just, we have such systemic misogyny in medicine that it's so rampant that we're constantly hitting up against a wall and women get stuck in the crosshairs. And then they almost feel like they have to fight for their rights. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's this, this is a fight every single day. And I don't think there's enough pressure on physicians and clinicians to stay abreast of current research, you know? And so women get gaslighted every single day. And I don't know about you, but I see it also on social media. I'm a nutrition professional, PhD. Believe me, if I could create a supplement that would replace hormone replacement, I would have it. I'd be selling it. <laughs> there are supplements that can absolutely make the symptoms better and improve some metabolic function, but it will never, ever replace hormones that your ovaries no longer make. And I, and that frustrates me. I know that's got to frustrate you. I see all these ads and stuff and I'm just, I want to scream from the mountaintop. Like that's not going to replace these hormones just because your hot flash has got slightly better. Right. It, it just doesn't. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. There was a, a, a person who will remain nameless on social media who was talking about just increase your carbohydrate intake. Uh, that will, that will help, you know, bolster, you know, your progesterone. And I thought to myself, if you understand the role of ovarian aging, so ovarian senescence, 
Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that women's biological clock is really attuned to our ovaries. That is what drives aging in our bodies as females. And so I, I find it so interesting when I'm like, if people understood that at a very basic level, it would make sense as to why, you know, what are those beginning stages of perimenopause symptoms as you have less circulating progesterone, anxiety, depression, insomnia, you know, the crime scene bleeds that all of us experience, which made us miserable. And you would pray that, or at least I used to pray, I would not start my cycle while I was rounding on patients in the hospital because there was not enough pads and not enough tampons to save me, but helping people understand that, you know, the, the role of these ovarian, um, the ovarian aging, ovarian senescence, these circadian clocks, these clocks in our bodies. Let's speak to this because I find this really interesting that this is, this is the main driver of aging in the body. It is what distinguishes us as women. And I think the more that women understand that our ovaries really are kind of the, you know, the spoke in the wheel, if you will, that's driving a lot of the symptoms we start experiencing in middle age. Yeah. You know, so I, we have to think about it from a very simplistic standpoint. Like we can get really technical and talk about, you know, egg supply and ovarian reserve, but we have to remember kind of Darwinism here. What does nature want? Nature wants us to reproduce and continue our species on the planet, right? We only need one man on the planet, honestly, <laughs> truly. We need a whole lot of women, right? He might need to look like Brad, Brad Pitt, mm -hmm. I'm just joking. But the reality is we need a lot of women in fertility that can keep the species going. So our entire biological clock is wired to how fertile are we? And when that ovarian reserve, and I like to think of it as a very simplistic terms, it's kind of like an egg carton. And we're born with a number of eggs in our carton. And as those eggs get used up, the carton shrivels, it starts to fail, hormones stop getting replaced. And when the egg carton is gone, it's flat out gone, right? And, you know, I don't know about you, but I started showing symptoms of perimenopause, the sleep, the, you know, anxiety, the irritability, particularly the insomnia. I started showing that in my late 30s. Like it, it was early and even in the functional medicine community, because I've owned my clinic for 20 years, everybody told me that, oh, no, 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 it can't be that yet. You, yes, your progesterone's declined, but but you're not really in menopause yet. You're just too much stress. This is your progesterone. But, you know, that's not necessarily true. Well, and I think you bring up some really good points that helping us kind of process and understand at a very basic physiological level. I love the egg analogy because I think all of us can think about that from the perspective of from the moment we are born, we are born with a finite amount of eggs. And from that point forward, we are kind of losing eggs as we go. And, and each month, it's interesting. I was interviewing Dr. Stacy Sims last night, and she was saying that when you and I, when all three of us were growing up in the seventies and eighties, that maybe two to three cycles out of an entire year, when a woman is fully matured, she was anovulatory, meaning she did not release an egg. It is now four to six times a year. So you start to think about the net impact of less ovulation on fertility, on, you know, procreation on all of these levels. And you just start to understand that you know, in, in many ways, kind of our modern day lifestyles have a significant net impact on our ability to procreate, reproduce if we choose to. And then also, you know, ultimately, does that hasten our progression into a state where, you know, there, we're now seeing so much premature ovarian insufficiency, which we used to call ovarian failure. Now they have all these different terminology, all this different terminology, but we're seeing it in younger and younger women and the significance of a woman going into POI at 39 or 40 is catastrophic versus average age of menopause here in the United States is 51. That's 11 years of your lifetime that you were exposed to less sex hormones, more impact on brain, bone, and heart health, which I think for many individuals, they may not realize is potentially catastrophic if it's not caught and addressed pretty proactively. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I, like I said, I've been in practice for 20 years. So I have this really long trajectory of just watching sort of anecdotally what happens. And 20 years ago, I spoke to people about infertility in their late, thir late, late, late thirties, early forties, you know, they'd waited to have children and now they're really working on infertility. I re, re routinely in our clinic have people come in in their early thirties with a diagnosis of POI. 
right? And you go, okay, what's happening, right? It, and, you know, we have all these endocrine disrupting ingredients and chemicals in our environment that not only look like estrogen and mimic our sex hormones, um, but have a profound effect on how our body sort of packages those to get rid of them. We have an extraordinary amount of stress compared to even 30, 40 years ago, which, you know, alters that sex hormone pathway pretty heavily. And, um, you know, on one side, we have more awareness, right? So people are looking and trying to figure out if this is an issue, but there is an endocrine problem that a couple generations out from now may be very catastrophic, truly. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting because I have colleagues that are working with younger women that are saying, you know, we're seeing a lot of POI in women that have an autoimmune underlying autoimmune condition that, you know, post pandemic, I don't even want to talk about vaccine issues, but it's interesting that they're starting to see over and over again, these younger women, 20, 30 something women that effectively have no menstrual cycles and they're not on the pill. They're not on an IUD. And as they're doing a workup, they're realizing they've got latent underlying autoimmune conditions that are driving some of this premature ovarian, these premature ovarian insufficiency issues, which again, we know if you go into premature ovarian insufficiency or even early menopause, it just magnifies the long-term effects that you can undergo if you are not being appropriately treated and managed. Absolutely. You know, viral infections are an absolute trigger and it doesn't matter which virus really, honestly, mm -hmm. we have research out there showing all viral infections are one of the many causes of autoimmunity, which of course is, affects women 10 to one to men. Um, but particularly that one, you know, COVID really did, um, have this affinity for reproductive organs and impact both on testicular function and ovarian function. And I think, you know, I haven't done a deep dive in the research, but I think if you were to really dig in and over the next several years, we're going to understand much more deeply what really happened there. Um, but I think that's a catalyst, you know, and now we're almost, you know, four years out from that four and a half years out, and we're starting to see it more and more. Yeah. I think we're, we're just seeing kind of the tip of the iceberg. I know that People like Dr. Anna Kabeca multiple times has shared with me that she had women in 10 years into menopause that started bleeding. Oh, yeah. And so I, I think there, there's more to this, you know, hypothalamus pituitary ovarian access than, or even adrenal access that we we're just now learning the net impact of specific viruses. Now, one of the things that I think is so fascinating to me as women are navigating perimenopause into menopause is this you know, you use the term metabolic derangement. I think about, you know, changes in metabolic flexibility, but let's speak to some of the kind of high level concepts as to why this is happening. Because I think for women that are listening, it'll help them understand the net impact of this change in estrogen levels, how that impacts insulin sensitivity. It is not so straightforward. It has kind of this domino effect in the body. Yeah. So, you know, this was one of the things, so I went back for my PhD among many, many reasons, I, I came to functional medicine because of autoimmunity. So this is a second career for me. And I, but I can tell you my forties were terrible. I gained like 35, almost 40 pounds in my late thirties to early forties, like overnight, having been in the bodybuilding world for eight years. So I knew how to manipulate body composition. And when I went back, I, I went back for multiple things. I wanted to understand hormone metabolism, but I also wanted to dig in kind of while I was in all that research and look at what happens metabolically? So we we throw out the idea that estrogen either extremely high in a perimenopausal state or extremely low in a menopausal or kind of just the cusp and postmenopausal state can drive some insulin resistance. But the mechanism was never really talked about, right? We kind of throw that out there. So if you don't understand the mechanism, you don't actually know how to address it. It's, it the root cause is not just insulin resistance. It's where is it occurring? So a couple of the things that I found when I was looking in my research is we have our mitochondrial function, our powerhouse in our cell. Insulin's job is to get it across the wall, right? Get glucose there and help it move. Well, the GLUT4 transporter, which I like to think of it as like shoots and ladders, it's a very low grade ladder. So it doesn't have, it's a passive transport. So it doesn't speedily take things into the cell, into the mitochondria. Well, estrogen has a direct impact on the GLUT4 transport, right? So we start to lose that your significant mechanism getting glucose into the powerhouse has now slowed. So think of it as, as the, the, the um, slide that had a really high pitch is now flat or almost flat. So it's like a slow roll. 
So you may be doing all the right things, but your body is actually less efficient with the insulin at the mitochondria. And then if we look at even adrenal receptors, right? The other thing is women hate what we call the jiggly bits, the subcutaneous fat. We don't like that. We get deposition there too, as estrogen levels increase during uh, perimenopause. And then obviously as estrogen levels decrease, we now get the increase of visceral fat in the abdominal cavity. Well, the adrenal nerves and the receptors for those adrenal nerves that are there to stimulate adiponectin, hormone sensitive lipase, all of that are also estrogen sensitive. So the fat that we can't stand that jiggles on our hips and thighs and lower abdomen is kind of first on last off anyway. But when our body is in this perimenopause to menopausal state, that innervation has now gone to sleep. So we feel like we're just banging our head against the wall, trying to do all the things that worked when we were in our thirties. The other thing that I found that I thought was very interesting. I know you've had uh, Rick Johnson on your show who I just adore, just, just adore uric acid levels and a menopausal woman climb significantly, which we know is sort of a mitochondrial barometer for do we turn up mitochondrial function? And so when you add that to this uh, feedback relationship with insulin and you add that to the increased inflammatory fat and the cytokines and all that other stuff, the visceral fat are up to the reality is, is without addressing hormones and getting hormones sort of back on board, you're, you are fighting somewhat of an uphill battle. I mean, the stats show that the average woman in menopause at that time period will gain 10 to 15% of their body fat, period. So if you're a 150 pound woman, that's 15 to 20 pounds off the bat, right? And then we go, gosh, you know, what's going on? And so we may not love the way we look in the mirror, but the other thing is, is all of that is driving disease activity, you know, and I, it's funny, my, my, you know, marketing people and everybody like Betty, nobody cares about their long-term health. they just care about what's happening now. And I'm like, I, I consider it my nursing home avoidance plan, right? I don't want cardiovascular disease and a stroke. I don't want dementia. I don't want osteoporosis because all of those things lead to potential time in an assisted living center, right? And I think that's the other side is we have to identify and also recognize that all of those things are part of that. And it's all metabolic. Yeah, it's so interesting to me. And, I, and when I think about like glute for transporters, I think about muscles and, and the role of sarcopenia, this muscle loss with aging and how critically important it is to maintain and build muscle as you are navigating your 40s, 50s and beyond. And I, I've spoken very openly. My One of the things that contributed to my dad's death this summer was frailty, sarcopenia, malnutrition. And, you know, as good as I am about working out, I actually hired a trainer and I told the trainer, here's my goal, five pounds of muscle. That's the goal. And she works me hard and not in a bad heart. It's a challenge my muscles, but not so that I'm wiped out and I can't function the next day. Like, you know, the workouts that I did in my twenties and thirties that I would hate to do now because it would just thrash the adrenals, but understanding that role of those glute four transporters that has that connection to estrogen also has that connection to insulin sensitivity. So when we suggest to women walk after a meal, helping them understand it's a way to actually utilize some of this, you know, glucose, dis it's like a glucose disposal system in, in some ways and helping people understand like, these are the things we must do. I used to make fun of lovingly, make fun of neighbors that would walk after they ate. You know, it was this very much this kind of cultural thing. You would see people walking the evening. And I said to my husband, they were brilliant because it's one of the best ways to help with insulin sensitivity, glucose disposal, you know, making use of those muscles, hopefully you haven't lost them all. And understanding that so much of this is within our control. Like we, if we live long enough, we will go into, we will eventually lead into menopause. Men go into andropause, although it's not nearly as dramatic, but when people understand like there's ways to do this proactively. So you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be scared. Um, I, I'm almost grateful. I knew less in my perimenopause journey than I do now, because I, I feel like perimenopause was wild and tough and challenging. Just like you said, you know, I gained a bunch of weight seemingly overnight and everything I used to do no longer worked. And yet now retrospectively looking at it saying, you know, what can we do to help women kind of prepare for this transition, but not fear it? Because I, I think for so many women, and you talked about, changes in fat deposition. And, you know, we are more prone to visceral fat and visceral fat is what's around our organs. 
we have to work out differently in menopause to address the visceral fat piece. You know, this loss of lean body mass and this gain of fat mass is a kind of natural progression if we are not actively working against it. Do you find that, you know, in the research, in the literature, given the fact that women have been left out, I think it was 1993 when, you know, things kind of improved, but still there are all these exclusion criteria. Women can easily be left out of medical research, which is unfortunate. But do you feel like because there has been uh, a magnification of supporting women through this menopausal journey. I feel like there's so many of us that are now speaking up, speaking out, trying to educate providers, trying to, you know, encourage women to advocate for themselves, to not take no as an answer for, you know, navigating this time in their lives. You know, for you personally, do you feel like there is more research that is being reported that is being focused on to help women make decisions from a, not just from a, a personal decision-making, but being able to amplify the benefits of not just lifestyle, but also hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. So um, you're absolutely right. It's interesting because in 2021, there was an uptick in, in expenditure for women's health initiative related research, specifically on women. Because the other thing is, is I personally believe that we need two, two additional arms. We need a male arm and a female arm to actually judge, particularly medication um, approval, because things can get lost in the data. And believe me, and you very well know mm -hmm. this, They'll just they'll just quietly bury the individual age related sex related differences. And if they can get the stats up enough, a drug will get approved regardless if it was good for everybody. Right. There's just too much um, bias in that in that industry. But so in 2021, there was an uptick. Interestingly enough, by 2023, it also went back down. Um, but the Biden administration earmarked one hundred twenty seven you know, million dollars. We have um, the uh, Melinda Gates just admitted that she was going to give over a billion dollars to women's um, nonprofit research. Uh, we also have an ARPA-H initiative, which is not actually grant dollars, but it's investment dollars into women's health initiatives uh, with some very specific things. So there is an effort to put more money and more resources towards women's research. And we have had some very strong studies come out in the last you know, two years that really call into question the sort of dogma that we've had over the last two decades. Um, you know, this is a passion project for me. It's actually why I started my telemedicine company and, and an entire technology, digital technology arm. I went back to get a PhD to understand how to do research. And I was like, I'm gonna contribute to the research. You know, because the reality is, you know this from being in the functional medicine community, we have so much data, but that data isn't being assimilated and pulled into a way to be able to help give directive because there's just not money in it, right? And so I'm trying very hard to do that because I think until we see that, we're going to have this continued bias and this continued sort of, um, you know, lack of change in the medical community. Um, and I do think the other thing is I'm pretty passionate and it comes out on my podcast. And I really think that women in this age group, we have the opportunity to change the entire industry, the entire world. Honestly, women have more buying power. Women make 87% of the buying decisions in a household. Let's face it. What mom does improves an environment. We know that even from small micro investments in other countries, we, as soon as you give a woman money and help her make money, the entire family and, and community changes. So the reality is we collectively, particularly women in this age group, can radically change what's happening if we step up and demand. You know, so that's my other side, my other, you know, not political, but very much like let's move as a group to make things happen because we can, right? We don't have to accept how things are today. You know, we well, can change it with money. Well, and I feel like, you know, our mother's generation probably accepted a lot. They were directly impacted by the Women's Health Initiative. You know, I just started practicing as a nurse practitioner in the 2001 timeframe frame. 2002 is when the WHI came out. And although I was fairly shielded from a lot of it, my patients that would talk to me about how their estrogen patches were stopped, how they no longer were allowed to take progesterone, how their sleep was impacted, their joint pain. Gosh, in cardiology, I mean, you want to talk about lighting a match. I mean, the degree of inflammation, oxidative stress, progression of plaque formation. Uh, I feel like our mother's generation deserves 
for us to amplify our messages so that subsequent younger generations are able to make really good decisions for themselves. And it could look different for everyone. You know, I will be the first person to say, educate, inspire, empower, but allow women to make the best decision for themselves, understanding the ramifications of whatever their choices are. Like I always say, like, HRT is right for me. It might be right for you. There may be someone else who says that's not what I want to do. And that's okay. But helping women understand they do have choices. They're not, you know, there's not going to just be this blanket statement that, you know, hormones are bad and therefore we should avoid hormones because they're so problematic. We won't even go down the rabbit hole talking about the WHI and why that was such a problematic study design in terms of study participants and et cetera. Now, one thing that I know you particularly like to talk about, and we probably have not gone into too much detail is talking about the role of the liver and processing hormones, why it is so important. This is not just woo woo. We're going to go do a detox. Although, you know, there, there are things we can do to support the liver and detoxification, which are real things that go on. Let's unpack why the liver is so important vis-a-vis the hormone regulation and, you know, maybe some high level explanations, differentiating phase one, phase two, phase three, because some of these terms might be new for a lot of people, but do it from kind of a high level perspective so that people can have a better understanding why the liver is so important. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I'm a real logical person. So, you know, what always confused me was our hormones are perfectly fine when we're young and fertile, giving high doses of birth control to control reproductive rights, completely normal, but something magical happened at 50. And all of a sudden it was like, those are now deadly. And I was like, well, that doesn't really make sense. But the other part of it was that when you look at particularly breast cancer risk, you know, ovarian cancer risk, it all accelerates radically when you go through menopause. And I'm like, okay, so if the party line is estrogen, your your estrogen causes it, then 20 year olds should have cancer, not 55 year olds. So my next obvious question was what causes that uptick or what could be a potential cause? It's a hard thing to prove out in science, honestly, but what could be potential contributors to that disease risk? And really what the research kind of points to as a potential player is the complex environment and complex process that our liver has to do to sort of, I like to think of it as wrapping up these hormones and toxins and other things that look like hormones to prep them, to get them to the dumpster. And this is a huge area of genetic variability. You know, so I, we've been doing genetics in my clinic for well over 13 years and, you know, one person may be great at it. And I like to joke that that's the person with the Keith Richards genes, you know, like how does that guy, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> like, how does he live like that? Whereas mm-hmm. if somebody else has one glass of wine and gets near a cigarette and can't function for three days, right? Mm-hmm. So, so some of that is we just either won the genetic lotto or not. So in the liver, we have, we have a three-stage process that the liver goes through to package hormones. And they're, they're very, very nutrient dependent. And, and they're also genetically dependent. So, I, so let's take estrogen, for example. So think of your estrogen as maybe it's a marker. I like to use this as an example. It's a marker. It's broken. It's leaking. You don't want it anymore. You've already used it. When you take it to the liver to get rid of it, the first step is designed to basically take a fat soluble molecule like estrogen and make it water soluble because then then you can get move it to the next stage. So we have one gene, the CYP1A1 gene that produces a, a, a metabolite called 2-hydroxyestrone. Don't have to remember that. All you have to remember is that's the clean metabolite. So think of it as I've got that highlighter. I've got a green wrapper around it, right? Lots of green. It's the, it's the three little bears. That's the porridge. That's the best. I have another gene, CYP3A1, that makes a blue wrapper. Not so great. If I make a lot of that estrogen metabolite called 16 alpha hydroxyhestrone, I'm going to have a metabolite that is what they call proliferative. It can go cause cells to remake themselves again and again and again if it's excessive. Then I have another route. It's CYP1B1, which makes 4 hydroxyestrone, which can attach itself to DNA and cause software damages that makes the cell replicate in a way that's not, not appropriate, which can cause tumor growth. 
depending on how you're wired genetically, you either make a lot of green, a little bit of blue, and a little bit of red, or you might make more red than you do blue or green. Now, that doesn't get it out of the body. You next have a gene called comethyltransferase that needs to wrap a pink wrapper around it. And that is nutrient dependent. It's folate, B12, B6, B2. It is dependent on your nutrition. And so depending on how much of that I have, I either wrap a pink wrapper around it or I don't. And if it can only get to that point and it doesn't get the pink wrapper on it, it's going to get recirculated. Once you have the pink wrapper on it, it has two more routes it can go. It can go to the glucuronidation pathway, which is basically the next stage, stage two stage two to three, and that's a black wrapper. Estradiol, which is your ovarian hormone, preferentially goes to estradiol, uh, goes down glucuronidation, and then goes into the stool through the bile to get excreted. Estrone, which is your other estrogen that you make and your fat cells make, more, more proliferative, is a more inflammatory hormone, and it has a preference to go through sulfation, which is a orange wrapper, and that gets excreted through the urine. When we're fertile, we have a lot more estradiol and a lot more in the glucuronidation pathway, a lot more black wrapper. When we're in menopause, we have we shift towards more estrone. Our fat cells make it because our body needs that estrogen. That's the thing that people need to understand. Our body needs estrogen. It's screaming for it. So we make more fat. We have an orange wrapper. And depending on how you eat, how you're genetically wired, it now gets to the dumpster. That's dumpster zone and it must go in order. So the other thing to know is your pesticides, herbicides, plasticizers, BPA, all of that stuff, phthalates, all of that hit those same pathways. So if you're not good at the wrappers and you can't do them in order, you don't get it out and it ends up getting recirculated either from the stool or from the liver itself back into the bloodstream. So ultimately what you get is a broken sort of half functional estrogen like molecule now clicking into receptors that want a real estradiol. And so that is where I think the next frontier is in understanding women's health, cancer risk, and a hundred other things. And, you know, I spent my entire research PhD sort of digging around in that and particularly what happens with the microbiome. And, and we just don't put enough focus there. But I think the big thing other people need to realize, too, is that what we eat, the nutrients we eat, the foods we eat can can shift the balance of how you move through those different wrappers. And that's the beauty of testing things like the Dutch test or a 24 hour urine hormone metabolite. We can see it and watch it and manipulate it. What a great analogy, you know, the wrappers. I think that allows people that are kind of visually attuned, like, okay, that makes sense. You touched on bile. Why is bile so important? I think it is doesn't get enough respect. I think we think about it breaks down and emulsifies fats, but there's so much more to bile that I think is really important understanding how we process and package up hormones. Yeah, so so bile is made in the liver and it contains all these metabolites. So all these wrapped up ingredients, you know, are basically encapsulated in the bile and then excreted into the gallbladder, if you still have it, and then expelled into the small intestines. And yes, it's there to emulsify the fats and it's there to, um, there to help you digest and break down fat soluble vitamins, but it's also the exit route. So I also think of it as kind of the sewer system. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. the sludge from the sewer. And it needs to get bound to fiber in the stool, right? That's how it gets bound up. And then most of it gets excreted in in the stool. But then we have some of the bile acids get reabsorbed. They actually exert some behaviors in the body. And then the body can kind of reprocess them, which gets done in the colon. So colon health starts to play a role. The microbiome starts to play a role. And, And you're right. We don't pay enough attention to the importance of bile, bile acid metabolites, and then how we absorb them. It's so interesting because I feel like, you know, there's a supplement called Tudka and I'm not even going to attempt to, it's an acronym, but it's long and complicated, but that has been life-changing, not just for myself, but so many of my patients and clients, because the bile is not just, as you appropriately stated, just about breaking down and emulsifying fats. It has, you know, there, there's this interplay between their mitochondria and brain health and all these other things that we 
you know, it's like bile is just thought of as this green, yucky, viscous substance. And yet there's so much more to it. Like I think back, I actually pulled out my pathophysiology book from a hundred years ago. And I mean, I think there was like five sentences on bile. It's like, it's just not respected. And yet I think for so many women, if we can optimize bile, it helps with detoxification and helps with brain health, helps with mitochondrial health. I don't know if you agree, but it's just been my clinical experience, not even looking at the research that this is one of these substances that, or sub supplements that if utilized appropriately in the right patient can have profound systemic effects. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a taurine bound bile acid basically, but it's anti-inflammatory, right? Mm -hmm. So it improves the viscosity or the kind of liquidness of bile, if you want to call it that. And it's anti-inflammatory, very, very helpful. Um, you know, and how many women have had their gallbladder removed, right? You know, that's kind of a standard, you know, my husband, my husband was as a firefighter paramedic recently, you know, stepped away and is retiring. Um, but he was like, you know, if they're over 40, so everybody mm -hmm. listen to this, if they're over 40 Caucasian with abdominal pain, it is gallbladder until proven otherwise, because hormones have an effect on that entire system. And I don't think we've dove in deep enough to that, but, but it's, it's, it's predominantly a women's problem compared to men. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing I think about, I have a colitis history. That's actually what brought me to functional medicine. And one of the major things you see with whether it's diverticulitis or colitis Crohn's potentially is bile acid malabsorption. Right. And we look at that and we go, okay, so it might cause diarrhea and damage and change to the intestinal colon and intestinal walls because it can be inflammatory if it's not reabsorbed. But then also what, you know, it's like, what happens when you're not reabsorbing all those bile acid metabolites and, you know, are they changing things like cognition and mitochondrial function? We don't know that, at least not any of the research that I've read. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, these little nuanced, and we used to have an acronym, which isn't very kind, but when I was an ER nurse in my past life, we would talk about, you know, a female 40 flatulent, obese Almost always, if they came in with abdominal pain, it was gallbladder mediated. They would probably tell you, I ate like a, you know, I went and had a fast food meal. I came in, I presented with this discomfort, you know, waxes and wane, it waxes and wanes almost always the gallbladder. And unfortunately, I think in many instances, we're so quick to remove organs without fully appreciating and understanding that you know, losing an organ is not in and of itself, you know, the, the end of the road. However, every organ is necessary. If we can find a way to kind of fine tune, adjust lifestyle, just like I've had my appendix removed. And we jokingly used to call the appendix a vestigial organ, meaning it has no, there's no need to have it. Little did I know until after I had it removed, it has all these important immune system properties. And so, you know, before we pull out organs, let's make sure we definitely, you know, can't do a workaround. So when I'm thinking about this process of detoxification, it is not just a put, you know, it's not just a program we put in a box that we utilize to support someone. What are some of the things that you have found to be most effective beyond testing specific to perhaps nutrition and lifestyle that are instrumentally important to support this process in the body? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I think you're, you kind of mentioned the detoxing, I think periodic detoxification where there's a, there's a planned sort support for liver function is always a good thing. But the reality is as soon as you detox, you retox, right? It, you go outside, you, you come in contact with something, you're in your house and things are outgassing. So there's always this level that we need to support liver function. Um, and I think some of the very basic things often get overlooked, like, you know, the cool biochemistry stuff is always exciting, but the basics need to happen. So I always think about first, you can't detoxify your liver or anything else until you make sure the gut is functioning properly, right? So if you're constipated, stuff's going to get reabsorbed anyway, right? Because think of it as you have a trash can, your house is 97.8 degrees, you left on vacation, and you left that trash can full of trash in your in your kitchen. When you come back, it's going to stink. And guess what, it'll have found a way to leak out of that plastic. Right? So our gut is the same way. We have to make sure that the things that are designed to exit get out on a regular basis. Right? So 
I want to make sure they're not constipated. I want to make sure that the bowels are moving. That means hydration. It also means fiber, right? Uh, you know, there's so many different diets out there, obviously. And, you know, there's a million and everything swings from one extreme to the other. But the simple fact is there is no question that fiber is protective to the human body and particularly valuable for women because not only does it bind to the bile acids and help you excrete what needs to get excreted, it can help lower cholesterol. It can help, you know, even binding estrogen. So the reality is, is fiber also keeps water in the stool. So it makes it bulky, easier to pass as long as you're hydrated. It'll make it like concrete if you're not hydrated. On the other flip side, if you have diarrhea, right, or you have bowel frequency, like, you know, as somebody with a colitis history, you know, knock on wood, I'm not on medications, but, you know, I'm always watching it, right? The other thing is if I have bile acid malabsorption and I'm having five or six bowel movements a day, I may have nutrient deficiencies. I may have, you know, things that need to get bound. I may just slow the thing down a little bit. So we start there, right? Because you got to remember if I'm trying to get all the way to the dumpster, I have to start at the dumpster and clear the pathway, right? And I, I see people that do heavy metal detoxes and all these other things, and they don't bother to clear the pathway. And you wonder why people get worse rather than yeah. better. And then the other side of it is you have to look at the most important nutrients that are part of the wrapper process in the liver. And I'm sorry to say it is not a juice cleanse. It is not a juice cleanse. It, th that is not going to help you detoxify. You're going to get high on your own supply because you're going to dump a bunch of toxins into the bloodstream and your body won't be able to excrete them because we need amino acids, which are going to be found in your proteins. Um, yes, you can get proteins from vegetarian sources, but we need a lot of those to conjugate or stick to these ingredients and make that final wrapper. And we need B vitamins and vitamin C and antioxidants. And so the other thing I look at is, is very basic stuff. I want to eat from a rainbow every day. And I want to eat seasonally and with variety, right? I'm not just eating spinach. I'm not just eating kale. I need to move those things around. And I want to eat a little bit of every color in fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. And then